I've heard you say that you think that be, um, there's no chance for steel to melt with, with jet fuel because it's so close to kerosene's burning. It takes 3,000 degrees to oh, turn steel oh, into liquid. Governor, governor, 3,000. To melt it, but you don't Eric, have to turn Eric, it into Eric, Eric. It doesn't have to turn It's into called a liquid false flag operation. Fall. Just like the Gulf of Tonkin incident when they told us we were attacked and they put us into the Vietnam War. And lo and behold, it was a lie. It never so happened. What's the theory, Governor? What, why would, no theory. Why would the George government Bush is a theory. Why would George Bush allow uh, go ask you know, them. three thousand people to go die ask them? Well, what do you? What's why your, would you they must allow? Have a reason. Why would they? Motive. Why would they allow fifty-eight thousand of us to die in Vietnam? I'm not asking you. I'm asking you about this incident. Oh, why you don't want to talk why, about other? No, I don't. Uh, other because false this flaggers. is about 9/11, which I'm very near and dear to, very oh. close. So I lost a lot of friends there. Really? I want to know why you think my government would allow something like that to happen. Have policemen, firemen. Traitors, moms, dads, Muslims. Why would they allow that to happen? For what reason? What's the motive? Money. I need more than money. Give me more. What do you mean money? Wars. One of the best known cases of a false flag op was carried out by the newly elected Adolf Hitler on February 27, 1933. Nazi documents uncovered at the end of World War II, as well as testimony during the Nuremberg trials, reveal what many historians already suspected, that Hermann Goering had set fire to the Reichstag, the German parliament building. The Nazis then produced their patsy, Marinus van der Lubbe, an extremely mentally handicapped young man who was found rolling around in an alley behind the Reichstag, naked. Van der Lubbe was then taken before a Nazi show trial, found guilty and sentenced to death. He was beheaded on January 10, 1934. Using the crisis he had created to pass laws similar to the USA Patriot Act, Hitler became dictator and set his sights on the world. By March of 1939, Hitler had already seized Czechoslovakia. Having gained both Austria and Czechoslovakia, Hitler desired to move east against Poland. But he did not want to look like the aggressor. Hitler needed an excuse for attacking Poland. It was Heinrich Himmler who came up with a plan. Thus the operation was codenamed Operation Himmler. On the night of August 31st, 1939, the Germans took an unknown prisoner from one of the concentration camps, dressed him in a Polish uniform, took him to the town of Gliwice on the German-Polish border, and then shot him. The stage scene with the dead prisoner dressed in a Polish uniform was supposed to appear as a Polish attack against the German radio station. German radio newspapers and newsreels were flooded with images of what appeared to be a dead Polish soldier who had dared attack the Reich. Now Hitler had his excuse to invade Poland, and the nightmare of World War II had begun. President Lyndon Baines Johnson needed a pretext to commit the American people to the already expanding covert war in Southeast Asia. Three communist PT boats attacked an American destroyer off the coast of Vietnam yesterday and today President Johnson's response was hard and tough. To any armed attack upon our forces, we shall reply. To any in Southeast Asia who ask our help in defending their freedom, we shall give it. In November of 2001, the LBJ Presidential Library and Museum released tapes of phone conversations with the President and then Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, where they openly discussed plans to use the staged Gulf of Tonkin incident as a pretext to expand the war. 
Then, in late 2005, the National Security Agency declassified its own official history of the Gulf of Tonkin and admitted that intelligence agency officers had deliberately skewed the intelligence and claimed that Vietnamese patrol boats had attacked U.S. destroyers on August 4, 1964, when in reality they had done nothing, even while being fired on by U.S. forces. Congress then authorized the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, the Tonkin Lie, paved the way for 58,000 American deaths and over a million and a half dead Vietnamese. realized with horror that I'd seen this awful thing before. suiciders uh, to kill innocent life uh, who would uh, who had relations with Zarqawi imagine what the world would be like with him in power the idea is to try to help change the Middle East now look I did part of the reason we went into Iraq uh, was uh, the main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't, but he had the capacity to make weapons of mass destruction. But I also talked about the human suffering in Iraq. And I also talked the need to advance a freedom agenda. And so my question, my answer to your question is, is that imagine a world in which Saddam Hussein was there, stirring up even more trouble in a part of the world that uh, had so much resentment and so much hatred that, three th that people came and killed 3,000 of our citizens. You know, I, I've heard this theory about, you know, everything was just fine until we arrived. And, then, you know, kind of, the, the, you know, stir up the hornet's nest theory. It just, it just doesn't hold water as far as I'm concerned. The terrorists attacked us and killed 3,000 of our citizens before we started the freedom agenda in the Middle East. They were. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing. That people came and killed 3,000 of our citizens. That people came and killed 3,000 of our citizens. That people came and killed 3,000 of our citizens.
The main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't. Uh, no weapons of mass destruction were found. Are you kidding me? Do you buy that? Yes. Of course there were mass. Of course there were. David, uh, there were, there doc, were, there were, there were. Nye, 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 nye. The terrorists attacked us and killed 3,000 of our citizens before we started the freedom agenda in the Middle East. They were. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing. Do you think Iraq attacked us on 9-11? On Maybe not Iraq itself, but the belief in the cause that those people have did. Yeah, absolutely. Fifteen of the 19 hijackers came from Saudi Arabia. Bush is out at his ranch holding hands with the royal princes. But then we've got to go into Iraq. No, I mean seriously, sir, it's a serious yeah, no, issue. Sure. If we don't like what a democratically elected leader of another country is doing, for example, opposing uh, the exploitation of oil in his country, as Chavez is doing in Venezuela, or the exploitation of gas or water, as Morales is doing in Bolivia, uh, then we try to corrupt people into changing that and going back to the old system. And we try to corrupt those particular officials. So. In the case of South America, in recent elections, uh, seven countries representing over 80 percent of, of South American population elected presidents that ran on an anti-corporatocracy platform. Now these presidents did not run on an anti-American or anti-European policy. Uh, if I as an American go to any one of these countries, I'll be embraced with open arms. And they love our principles. They love our Declaration of Independence, but they hate having their resources exploited by us. That's, that's what they ran against, the corporatocracy. And once these presidents were elected, someone who looks like me, I had the job at one time, will walk into that president's office, speaks the language, speaks Spanish, whatever, Portuguese, walks into the office and says, congratulations, Mr. President, or in the case of Chile, Ms. President, and now I just want to remind you that I can make you and your family very, very rich if you play my game, our game. Or I can see to it that you're thrown out of office or assassinated if you decide to fulfill your campaign promises. And usually it's said a little more subtly than that because there may be a tape recorder listening. But they get the message because every one of those presidents knows what happened to Arbenz of Guatemala and Allende of Chile and Roldos of Ecuador, and Lumumba of the Congo, and, and Torrijos, and on and on. The list is, is very long of presidents that we have had thrown out or assassinated. There's no question about that. And they all know this. So we perpetuate the system that way. Here you offer, from this, hand, from this pocket, you offer a few hundred million dollars, corruption. Or from this pocket, you offer subversives, jackals, to go in and overthrow the government or assassinate the president. And if I'm in that position, if I'm the president, and even if I'm very integritous and I really believe in what I'm going to do, what, what, what I've said, well, what am I going to do? Because I know that they can do this. So I'm very tempted to accept the corruption because if I don't, I'm going to be taken out. And if I'm taken out, what's the next guy going to do? He's going to be scared to death. And so, yes, there are a lot of very corrupt officials, but who's doing the corrupting? We're doing the corrupting in most most cases. And I talked about this on a presidential level, but it happens all the way down through the ranks. It happens at every governmental level, and it happens in the corporations in those countries, and it happens throughout the whole system. So if, if the corporatocracy does not like what's going on in Nigeria or Botswana or Thailand or any other country, they go in and they send people like me and they send the economic hitman in and, and, and we try to corrupt the system. We, we offer the, the bribe and at the same time the threat. 
And if the leader doesn't buy, then in fact we do send in what we call the jackals, and they overthrow the government or they assassinate the leader. And this has happened time and time and time again. In Iran under Mossadegh, you know, we, uh, we, 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 we overthrew a leader, a democratically elected leader, because he wanted to and get more of the pro oil profits from Iranian oil to go to the Iranian people. We did the same thing in Iraq under Qasim, who was a very popular president of Iraq and decided that he uh, wanted to get more of the profits from Iraqi oil to go to the Iraqi people, not to the foreign companies. So we decided he had to go, he had to be assassinated. We sent an assassination team in the early 60s. It was headed by a young man at the time who failed uh, and got, got, got wounded in the process and had to flee the country, that was Saddam Hussein. He was our hired assassin. He failed, so the CIA went in directly and had uh, Qasim publicly executed on Iraqi television and put Saddam's family in power. Um, we've done this time after time after time. Usually the economic hitmen are successful, so we don't need to send in the jackals. But on those occasions when we're not successful, as for me, I, was, I, was, I failed with Omar Torrijos in Panama and Jaime Roldos in Ecuador. And so the jackals were sent in and assassinated these men. On the very few instances when neither the economic hitmen nor the jackals are successful, then and only then do we send in the military. And this is what happened in, in Iraq. You know, we, the economic hitmen were unable to bring Saddam Hussein around. The jackals were unable to take him out. He had very loyal guards and he had look-alike doubles so it was difficult to take him out and so we sent in the military and the first time we sent in the military um, we could have certainly taken Saddam out at that point but we didn't want to he was the type of strong man that the corporatocracy loves he could keep the Iranians on the, in their borders and keep the Kurds under control and keep pumping oil to us and we figured that in 91 when we took his military out that we had sufficiently chastised him that now he would come around, and he didn't. When the economic hitmen went back in in the 90s, he still refused, and the, the jackals weren't able to take him out then again. So this time we sent in the military, and we did take him out, and the rest is history. Tony Benn, you'd like to pick up what's been said so far? I was born about a quarter of a mile from where we're sitting now, and I was here in London during the Blitz. And every night I went down to the shelter, 500 people killed, my brother was killed, my friends were killed. And when the charter of the UN was read to me, I was a pilot coming home in a troop ship. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has caused untold suffering to mankind. That was the pledge my generation gave to the younger generation, and you tore it up, and it's a war crime that's been committed in Iraq, because there's no moral difference, there's no, there's no moral difference between a stealth bomber and a suicide bomber. Both kill innocent people for political reasons. And that's why in Britain, the majority against, in America worldwide, there's no support for the United States in this worldwide. And you're living, you're a declining empire as we were, and you'll learn the truth. They are definitely testing new weapons at this very moment. This is just another American, un illegal, discredited adventure in attacking people and, and calling it humanitarian and justifying on the basis that supposedly it's humanitarian, it's for the best of the world, but really it's about seizing control of Libya and making sure that any popular uprising in Libya is eliminated. Going forward, the lead in enforcing the no-fly zone and protecting civilians on the ground will transition to our allies and partners, and I am fully confident that our coalition will keep the pressure on Gaddafi's remaining forces. 
This formal transition does not make the U.S. any less involved. In fact, the Pentagon official said Friday that even as other nations begin taking a larger role in the international air assault mission in Libya, the Pentagon was considering adding Air Force gunships and other attack aircraft. And within NATO as well, the U.S. is the largest contributing the organization. This is really a U.S.-led operation. And you talk about the Arab states that are involved. The Arab states are tyrannies that are hated by their own people. This is a, this is a piece of theater set up by Mrs. Clinton and Mrs. Mr. McCain and the, the bipartisan group that loves to intervene abroad. In the Muslim world, this is Americans killing Muslims again, and it looks like it's for oil. I mean, once the U.S. government can't pay its interest on all the bonds that have been sold overseas and all of the outstanding debt that it has, then we're theoretically bankrupt. What do you think is going to happen when China can't get its money for the United States? What do you think is going to happen when the United States, because we use 25 percent of the world's energy, starts to run out of oil in Iraq and starts to invade other Middle Eastern countries, which we'll probably do beforehand, but starts to do that. And China, of course, who gets oil from Iran, says, you know what, I think we're going to have to stop you guys from taking Iran's oil because we need that too, and you owe us a lot of money. It's kind of pissing us off. Do you think war between these superpowers might be possible? Hmm. I think World War III could be very, very possible, and this war will be for real. This will not be a contrivance war like World War I and World War II based on geopolitical realigning and various resource grabs. This will be a war for a survival of different countries. And I hope that doesn't happen.
we have over 15 million people unemployed. 10 to 12 million people will lose their homes in the next year. 47 million Americans go to bed hungry every night. 47 million Americans don't have any health care. Millions of Americans have lost their investments, their pensions, their retirement security. We have things to take care of here at home, and we cannot continue to spend money on these foreign adventures. War is part of our permanent economy, and a war-based economy eventually is going to collapse because you, it, it relies on death, it makes money for military contractors, it, it uh, limits the opportunities of young people for the future, and it drains money from other priorities. This can't, we can't sustain this. America's going broke. War on terror has the ability to allow the U.S. to carry out military operations that since 2001 have taken the lives of more than a million civilians in Iraq, in Afghanistan, now in Libya. And of course, that leads to an escalation of resistance of hatred, of revenge. And so in terms of keeping the American people safe, that's a ridiculous notion. a day. The UK's biggest banks are rescued by the British taxpayer. The world's central banks act together to slash interest rates. And yet the International Monetary Fund warns we're facing a major economic downturn. The day began with the bailout. The Prime Minister and the Chancellor making it clear that the financial system is so important to our society that by saving our banks, we're saving ourselves. If you read economics, they present it as though it's a science. If I, uh, I've read through much of the curriculum of what bachelor's and master's degree Harvard University students would read for their degrees in economics. Economics is not a science. It's an invention. It's a contrivance. It's funny, you look at economics books and they have graphs and charts and they make complex novel equations. It's all contrived. It doesn't have any relationship to the natural order of things. It is based upon a folk way of orienting production and distribution, and we've established this massive structure that makes it seem valid. Uh, there's really nothing anyone needs to know about economics than the fact that the entire global economic system is based upon people constantly consuming, irregardless of the state of affairs and natural orders of energy, planetary materials, and anything else. It is blind, narrow consumption with absolutely no regard for the environment. As of right now, we are running out of oil. We are going to be running out of natural gas. In fact, very simply, all fossil fuels, which is the governance of all society, our entire society is, a, is completely created based on fossil fuels, from the plastics, everything, I won't even go into it. Anyone who questions that, just take a moment to think about what oil powers, what fossil fuels power, from the lights that we all use, from the coal or natural gas power plants, to what runs your car, to what comprises the, the fabric of industrial civilization is fossil fuels, and we are provably using them at a rate far exceeding uh, their renewability, which takes hundreds of millions of years. No one's thinking about this. No one is thinking about it because the economic paradigm will not allow it. The core value of uh, Western society today, I mean, in America, the central motivating value now is nothing but blind consumption. And then during the Depression, there were 15 million people sleeping in every empty lot. That's a lot of people. What happened is they bought houses and cars, and the banks failed. You know what? They closed down. And they couldn't get their own money out. 
so they were kicked out of the buildings they bought. And they were sleeping in every empty lot, millions of Americans. And I looked around, and the stores had everything in the windows, you know, radios in those days, whatever people would need, but they had no money. So then I thought, there's something wrong with our system. You know, how can this happen in this country? I didn't have any answers, but there were people up on soapboxes talking about Mankind United, a new organization, technocracy, socialism, communism. Every park, every, every university, kids were talking about social change because conditions were bad. See, that brought them around to it. So uh, at that time, I, hitchhiked, I was going to hitchhike to Florida for other reasons because the winter was so cold, we didn't have heat and I had to get to Florida, so in hitchhiking toward Florida, when I, I saw an old man walking with all his worldly goods on his shoulder, you know, on a, they call him a bindle stiff. That's an impoverished person with all his worldly goods in a blanket, and he was shuffling very slow. So I called out to him. I wanted to help him carry that load, but he can hardly walk. But I called out several times. He was also hard of hearing. And he turned around and he had acromegalia. You know what that is? Elephant man disease. His face was all distorted. And as a kid, I didn't know what that was. And I was kind of shocked by that. And I kept hitchhiking till I got into, I think it was Savannah, Georgia. And I went to the local police station. And I said, I have no place to sleep. Can I sleep in a jail? I said, only if we fingerprint you. Well, since I didn't, didn't commit any crimes, I said, sure, go ahead. Then they put me in this jail with a dull red light. I must have been about 16 or so. And uh, uh, the toilet bowl had shit all over it. It was filthy. There was no place to sleep. It was dirty. So I just sat in the corner and looked at that red light. It was so depressing. And then I heard moaning in the next cell. And I looked in there, it was this dull red light. There was this guy with acromegalia, the old man, with a distorted face, who couldn't speak. So I banged on the bars of the prison, and a trustee came over. He said, what do you want? I said, this old man belongs in a hospital, not prison. I said, they're no good bum. These people seem to have no humanity at all, none. So I said, he belongs in the hospital. Well, ah, shut up. He went away. And I left the next day, and I met another kid my age, about 16 or so, and we both continued together. And uh, the guy drove up in a fairly new-looking car, and he said, would you kid like to make a buck? So the kid that I was with said, I'd like to make a buck. What do you want me to do? So I want you to tell my girlfriend I can't see her Saturday. I'll be occupied, and so she'll give you a package for me. So what the note said, I found out later, the girl was a cashier at a movie theater, and the note that the kid gave to the girl was, if you don't give the kid all the money you've got there, we'll blow your head off. We've got guns aimed at you. So the guy was using this kid, and this kid didn't know what the hell it was about. So the woman screamed, and the police came and took the kid away. I had nothing I could do. I was in rags myself, you know. And I remember saying in my own head, boy, this shit's got to go. Tonight on The Money Program, we're going to look at money. Lots of it on film and in the studio. Some of it in nice piles, others in lovely clanky bits of loose change. Some of it neatly counted into fat little hundreds, delicate fibres stuffed into bulging wallets, nice crisp clean checks, pert pieces of copper coinage thrust deep into trouser pockets, romantic foreign money rolling against the thigh with rough familiarity, beautiful wayward curlicued banknotes, filly great copper grating cheek by jowl with tumbling hexagonal milled edges rubbing gently against the terse leather of beautifully balanced bank books.
this is my Honda S2000. It's supercharged, it's intercooled. It has a nitro system in it. This is my everyday car. It's a BMW 530i. We got my barbecue pit and I'm sick. This is the best, man. This is the motherfucking best, man. I put me a motherfucking hamburger on here, a hot dog on here. So this is my pool. I look here. This is the finest. This is the best. The best swimming pool or either uh, whatever you want it. Look, I even got a bitch up here. This is our foyer. This is the 40 foot ceiling. This is my workout room. My guest bedroom. Oh, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it, hold it. I got my real partner over here sitting back up in my guest bedroom. You understand me looking at some real entertainment things. Oh, cracking y'all. What's really going on? This how we do it over here in Playersville. This is the arcade. At night, we like to come out here. The pool's heated, so when it's cold outside, it's sort of like a giant hot tub. Right here, look here. Look. He got a convertible top on my guest bedroom. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, look at that. That's big crank, baby. What we got here is our lake with our boat. It's my bike. It's a Repsol CBR. It's like being on vacation every day. It is. It truly is. Fuck, man. See what I'm talking about? See what I'm talking about? I got shit on my motherfucking floor, man. Money changers, those who loan out and manipulate the quantity of money, were active in medieval England. In fact, they were so active that acting together, they could manipulate the entire English economy. These were not bankers per se. The money changers generally were the goldsmiths. They were the first bankers because they started keeping other people's gold for safekeeping in their vaults. The first paper money was merely a receipt for gold left at the goldsmith. Paper money caught on because it was more convenient than carrying around a lot of heavy gold and silver coins. Eventually, goldsmiths noticed that only a small fraction of the depositors ever came in and demanded their gold at any one time. Goldsmiths started cheating on the system. They discovered that they could print more money than they had gold, and usually no one would be the wiser. Then they could loan out this extra money and collect interest on it. This was the birth of fractional reserve banking, that is, loaning out many times more money than you have assets on deposit. So, if $1,000 in gold were deposited with them, they could loan out about $10,000 in paper money and draw interest payments on it, and no one would ever discover the deception. By this means, goldsmiths gradually accumulated more and more wealth and used this wealth to accumulate more and more gold. Today, this practice of loaning out more money than there are reserves is known as fractional reserve banking. Every bank in the United States is allowed to loan out at least 10 times more money than they actually have. That's why they get rich on charging, let's say, 8% interest. It's not really 8% per year, which is their income. It's 80%. That's why bank buildings are always the largest in town. By the end of the 1600s, England was in financial ruin. 50 years of more or less continuous wars with France and Holland had exhausted her. Frantic government officials met with the money changers to beg for the loans necessary to pursue their political purposes. The price was high, a government-sanctioned, privately-owned bank which could issue money created out of nothing. It was to be the modern world's first privately-owned central bank, the Bank of England. Although it was deceptively called the Bank of England to make the general population think it was part of the government, it was not. Like any other private corporation, the Bank of England sold shares to get started. The investors, whose names were never revealed, were supposed to put up one and a quarter million British pounds in gold coin to buy their shares in the bank, 
but only 750,000 pounds was ever received. Despite that, the bank was duly chartered in 1694 and started out in the business of loaning out several times the money it supposedly had in reserves, all at interest. In exchange, the new bank would loan British politicians as much of the new currency as they wanted, as long as they secured the debt by direct taxation of the British people. So, legalization of the Bank of England amounted to nothing less than legal counterfeiting of a national currency for private gain. Unfortunately, nearly every nation now has a privately controlled central bank using the Bank of England as the basic model. Such is the power of these central banks that they soon take total control over a nation's economy. It soon amounts to nothing but a plutocracy ruled by the rich. It would be like putting control of the army in the hands of the mafia. The danger of tyranny would be extreme. The central bank scam is really a hidden tax. The nation sells bonds to the central bank to pay for things it does not have the political will to raise taxes to pay for. But the bonds are purchased with money the central bank creates out of nothing. More money in circulation makes your money worth less. The government gets as much money as it needs and the people pay for it in inflation. The beauty of the plan is that not one person in a thousand can figure it out because it's usually hidden behind complex sounding economics gibberish. Both the Bank of England and the Bank of France were nationalized after World War II and nothing changed, nothing at all. They endure and continue to grow, now protected by numerous laws, paid politicians, and mortgaged media, untouched by the changing of generations. Three centuries have given them an aura of respectability. The old school tie is now worn by the sixth generation son, who's been raised in a system that he may never question as he is named to serve on the governing boards of countless philanthropic organizations. To focus attention today on individuals or families, or to attempt to sort out the current holders of power serves little useful purpose and would be a distraction from the cure. The problem is far bigger than that. It is the corrupt banking system that was and is being used to consolidate vast wealth into fewer and fewer hands that is our current economic problem. Change the names of the main players now and the problem will neither go away nor even miss a beat. Likewise, among the hordes of bureaucrats working in the World Bank, central banks, and international banks, only a tiny fraction have any idea of what's really going on. No doubt they'd be horrified to learn that their work is contributing to the terrible impoverishment and gradual enslavement of mankind to a few incredibly rich plutocrats. This is not some wild conspiracy theory. The Federal Reserve really, even though it is not part of the federal government, it is more powerful than the federal government. It's more powerful than the president, the Congress, and the courts. Now, a lot of people challenge me on that, but let me prove my case. The Federal Reserve determines what the average person's car payment is going to be, what their house payment is going to be, and whether they have a job or not. And I submit to you that that's total control. And the Federal Reserve is the largest single creditor of the United States government. What does Proverbs tell us? The borrower is servant to the lender. Lewis T. McFadden, Republican of Pennsylvania, said in 1932, We have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board. This evil institution has impoverished the people of the United States and has practically bankrupted our government. It has done this through the corrupt practices of the moneyed vultures who control it. Beware of any plans advanced for a regional or world currency. This is the international banker's Trojan horse.
going to make a prediction based on this debt ceiling debacle and the suggestion that the Pentagon would have to get some cuts per today's Financial Times. I'm predicting false flag terror attack in the next 90 days. branches out not only into personal habits, it goes into economic affairs, and then uh, they get bolder and start telling other people in other countries what they should do and shouldn't do. Humanity has to start thinking about its relationship to the Earth. Until it does so, we're fucking doomed. And as my friend Jimmy Pineapple would say, case fucking closed. See, I think there are two ways in which people are controlled. First of all, frighten people, and secondly, demoralize them. An educated, healthy, and confident nation is harder to govern. And I think there's an element in the thinking of some people. We don't want people to be educated, healthy, and confident because they would get out of control. <laughs> the top 1% of the world's population own 80% of the world's wealth. It's incredible that people put up with it, but they're poor, they're demoralized, they're frightened, and therefore they think perhaps the safest thing to do is take orders and hope for the best. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. You and I are not in the big club. And by the way, it's the same big club they use to beat you over the head with all day long when they tell you what to believe. All day long, beating you over the head in their media, telling you what to believe, what to think, and what to buy. The table is tilted, folks. The game is rigged, and nobody seems to notice Nobody seems to care. Good, honest, hard-working people, white collar, blue collar, it doesn't matter what color shirt you have on. Good, honest, hard-working people continue, these are people of modest means, continue to elect these rich cocksuckers who don't give a fuck about them. They don't give a fuck about you. They don't give a fuck about you. They don't care about you at all, at all, at all. Man, you know? And nobody seems to notice, nobody seems to care. That's what the owners count on, the fact that Americans will probably remain willfully ignorant of the big red, white, and blue dick that's being jammed up their assholes every day. Because the owners of this country know the truth. It's called the American dream, because you have to be asleep to believe it. So in the U.S., we have more stuff than ever before. But polls show that our national happiness is actually declining. Our national happiness peaked in the 1950s, the same time that this consumption mania exploded. Hmm, interesting coincidence. I think I know why. We have more stuff, but we have less time for the things that really make us happy. Friends, family, leisure time. We're working harder than ever. Some analysts say we have less leisure time than any time since feudal society. And do you know what the two main activities are that we do with the scant leisure time we have? Watch TV and shop. In the US, we spend three to four times as many hours shopping as our counterparts in Europe do. So we're in this ridiculous situation where we go to work, maybe two jobs even, and we come home and we're exhausted. So we plop down on our new couch and watch TV, and the commercials tell us, you suck. So you gotta go to the mall to buy something to feel better, and then you gotta go to work more to pay for the stuff you just bought. So you come home and you're more tired, so you sit down and you watch more TV, and it tells you to go to the mall again, and we're on this crazy work, watch, spend treadmill. <laughs> Because you people 
And 62 million other Americans are listening to me right now because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it ever falls into the hands of the wrong people. And when the largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world, who knows what shit will be peddled for truth on this network. So you listen to me. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. So if you want the truth, go to God. Go to your gurus. Go to yourselves. Because that's the only place you're ever going to find any real truth. But man, you're never going to get any truth from us. We'll tell you anything you want to hear. We lie like hell. We'll tell you that uh, Kojak always gets the killer and that nobody ever gets cancer in Archie Bunker's house. And no matter how much trouble the hero is in, don't worry, just look at your watch. At the end of the hour, he's going to win. We'll tell you any shit you want to hear. We deal in illusions, man. None of it is true. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You ate like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. People are locked into a box. They see the box around them. They see the leaks and the holes and the cracks. And they go up to the cracks and they try to fix them. They try to patch the holes. But they don't stop to think that maybe there's something wrong with the box itself. Maybe the integrity of the box that they exist in is inherently invalid. It's inherently void. The economic system that we live in is a parasitic paradigm that is only going to lead to self-destruction. But people don't see that. So if you attack the economic system for what it actually is, everyone's feathers go up. Everyone says, well, wait a minute, this is the world we all live. We live in a profit-based, labor-for-income world, cyclical consumption. This is what we're used to. We understand we have division of classes. You know, they throw in human nature. They throw in everything that will try to make it seem like it's a part of the natural order of reality when it, in fact, is not. While I've been in Kenya, I've seen some appalling examples of poverty, but there's always been a glimmer of hope. Here in Eldoret, I meet a glue community who seem to be at the very bottom of the human pile. We're in downtown Eldoret. We've come to meet the glue kids. Uh, these kids are addicted to solvents, and they're just some of the 350,000 kids that are homeless in Kenya. With the post-election violence, parents being killed or displaced, that number is expected to increase dramatically. I've witnessed many things on my travels, but I was truly horrified by what was happening around me. We just arrived, we're setting up, and what I wasn't prepared for was the fact that there are obviously young girls here that have children in part of this glue community. One of the most shocking things I've ever seen in my life is the mothers who are heavily addicted are giving the glue bottle to their toddlers. We 
What's your name? Alex Bungie. Alex, yeah? And how old are you? Are you 11 years You're 11 years old, yeah? Yes. And how long have you been on the street? Two years. Two years. And why did you end up here? My mother is in here. Well, she takes glue or drink? Drunkards. Alcohol? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> when did you start taking glue? When you came here? One year. One year? Yes. Is it good? Do you want to keep doing it? No. But why do you do it? I am it hurts your chest? Yes. Would you like to leave the streets? What would you like to do? What would you like to do in the future? To go to school. To go to school? Yes. Folks, it's time to evolve ideas. We, you know, evolution did not end with us growing thumbs. You do know that, right? <laughs> didn't end there. We're at the point now where we, we're going to have to evolve ideas. The reason the world's so fucked up is we're undergoing evolution. And the reason our institutions, our traditional religions are all crumbling is because they're no longer relevant. <laughs> My name is Jock Fresco. I'm an industrial designer and a social engineer. I'm very much interested in society in developing a system that might be sustainable for all people. First of all, the word corruption is a monetary invention. That aberrant behavior, behavior that's disruptive to the well-being of people while you're dealing with human behavior. And human behavior appears to be environmentally determined, meaning if you were raised by the Seminole Indians as a baby, never saw anything else, you'd hold that value system. And this goes for nations, it goes for individuals, for families. They try to indoctrinate their children to their particular faith and their country and make them feel like they're part of that and they build a society which they call established. They establish a workable point of view and tend to perpetuate that, whereas all societies are really emergent, not established. And so they fight new ideas that would interfere with the establishment. Governments try to perpetuate that which keeps them in power. People are not elected to political office to change things. They're put there to keep things the way they are. So you see, the basis of corruption is in our society. Let me make it clear. All nations, then, are basically corrupt because they tend to uphold existing institutions. I don't mean to uphold or downgrade all nations. But communism, socialism, fascism, the free enterprise system, and all other subcultures are the same. They are all basically corrupt. The most fundamental characteristic of our social institutions is the necessity for self-preservation. Whether dealing with a corporation, a religion, or a government, the foremost interest is to preserve the institution itself. For instance, the last thing an oil company would ever want is the utilization of energy that was outside of its control, for it makes that company less relevant to society. Likewise, the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union was, in reality, a way to preserve and perpetuate the established economic and global hegemony of the United States. Similarly, religions condition people to feel guilty for natural inclinations, each claiming to offer the only path to forgiveness and salvation. At the heart of this institutional self-preservation lies the monetary system, for it is money that provides the means for power and survival. Therefore, just as a poor person might be forced to steal in order to survive, it is a natural inclination to do whatever is needed to continue an institution's profitability. This makes it inherently difficult for profit-based institutions to change, for it puts in jeopardy not only the survival of large groups of people, but also the coveted materialistic lifestyles associated with affluence and power. 
Therefore, the paralyzing necessity to preserve an institution, regardless of its social relevance, is largely rooted in the need for money or profit. What's in it for me is why people think. And so if a man makes money selling a certain product, naturally he's going to fight the existence of another product that may threaten his institution. Therefore, people cannot be fair. And people do not trust each other. A guy will come over to you and say, I got just the house you're looking for. He's a salesman. When a doctor says, I think your kidney has to come out, I don't know if he's trying to pay off a yacht or that my kidney has to come out. It's hard in a monetary system to trust people. If you came into my store and I said, this lamp that I've got is pretty good, but the lamp in the next door is much better, I wouldn't be in business very long. It wouldn't work. If I were ethical, it wouldn't work. So when you say industry cares for people, that's not true. They can't afford to be ethical. So your system is not designed to serve the well-being of people. If you still don't understand that, there would be no outsourcing of jobs if they cared about people. Industry does not care. They only hire people because it hasn't been automated yet. So don't talk about decency and ethics. We cannot afford it and remain in business. It is important to point out that regardless of the social system, whether fascist, socialist, capitalist, or communist, the underlying mechanism is still money, labor, and competition. Communist China is no less capitalistic than the United States. The only difference is the degree by which the state intervenes in enterprise. The reality is that monetaryism, so to speak, is the true mechanism that guides the interests of all the countries on the planet. The most aggressive and hence dominant variation of this monetarism is the free enterprise system. The fundamental perspective as put forth by early free market economists like Adam Smith is that self-interest in competition leads to social prosperity as the act of competition creates incentive which motivates people to persevere. However, what isn't talked about is how a competition-based economy invariably leads to strategic corruption, power and wealth consolidation, social stratification, technological paralysis, labor abuse, and ultimately, a covert form of government dictatorship by the rich elite. The word corruption is often defined as moral perversion. If a company dumps toxic waste into the ocean to save money, most people recognize this as corrupt behavior. On a more subtle level, when Walmart moves into a small town and forces small businesses to shut down for they are unable to compete, a gray area emerges. For what exactly is Walmart doing wrong? Why should they care about mom and pop organizations they destroy? Yet even more subtly, when a person gets fired from their job because a new machine has been created which can do the work for less money, people tend to just accept that as the way it is, not seeing the inherent corrupt inhumanity of such an action. Because the fact is, whether it is dumping toxic waste, having a monopoly enterprise, or downsizing the workforce, the motive is the same, profit. They are all different degrees of the same self-preserving mechanism which always puts the well-being of people second to monetary gain. Therefore, corruption is not some byproduct of monetarism. It is the very foundation. So you see, you have built-in corruption. We're all chiseling off each other, and you can't expect decency in that sort of thing. And feeling that, they don't know who to elect. They think in terms of a democracy, which is not possible in a monetary-based economy. If you have more money to advertise your position, the position you desire in government, that isn't a democracy. It serves those in position of differential advantage. 
So it's always a dictatorship of the elitists, the financially wealthy. It's not politicians that can solve problems. They have no technical capabilities. They don't know how to solve problems. Even if they were sincere, they don't know how to solve problems. It's the technicians that produce the desalinization plants. It's the technicians that give you electricity, that give you motor vehicles, that heat your house and cool it in the summertime. It's technology that solves problems, not politics. Politics cannot solve problems because they're not trained to do so. Very few people today stop and consider what it is that actually improves their lives. Is it money? Obviously not. One cannot eat money or stuff money into their car to get it to run. Is it politics? All politicians can do is create laws, establish budgets, and declare war. Is it religion? Of course not. Religion creates nothing except intangible emotional solace for those who require it. The true gift that we as human beings have, which has been solely responsible for everything that has improved our lives, is technology. What is technology? Technology is a pencil which allows one to solidify ideas on paper for communication. Technology is an automobile which allows one to travel faster than feet would allow. Technology is a pair of eyeglasses which enables sight for those who need it. Applied technology itself is merely an extension of human attributes which reduces human effort freeing humans from a particular chore or problem. Imagine what your life would be like today without a telephone, or an oven, or a computer, or an airplane. Everything in your home which you take for granted from a doorbell, to a table, to a dishwasher, is technology generated from the creative scientific ingenuity of human technicians, not money, politics, or religion. These are false institutions. Now back to the United States. The dollar has been tumbling against the world's major currencies after plans by the U.S. Federal Reserve to buy out treasury bonds and mortgage securities. The trillion dollars needed that is for the bringing the jitters to those dealing in dollars. And uh, for more on this, I'm now joined live by our correspondent in New York, Marina Portnoy. Marina, it seems the Obama administration hopes to kickstart the economy by simply printing money. I mean, it's just as the British government and others have uh, decided to do. That is right, and it's a very good observation. The Federal Reserve is once again stepping up efforts to save the U.S. economy, announcing that it will pump an extra $1 trillion into the U.S. financial system by purchasing treasury bonds and mortgage securities. Now, the idea, of course, is to encourage economic activity by lowering interest rates, including those on home loans. While this may bring a short-term jolt, Many critics say that printing money, vast amount of money, out of thin air will bring disastrous consequences. More specifically, hyperinflation and the plunge of the U.S. dollar. Many experts have gone on record saying that the U.S. monetary policy has passed the point of no return when it comes to printing money.